see it. Hello and welcome to LBC Irregulars, a Sherlock Holmes podcast radio episode brought to you by the Long Box Crusade. This is episode seven of the radio series. On this episode, we will listen to the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, the Notorious Canary Trainer. Season five, episode 79, April 23rd, 1945. And it features Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. I want to give a thanks to the Arthur Conan Doyle Encyclopedia website. They keep me straight on all these numberings of seasons and whatnot. Now, after we listen to the show, my guests and I will discuss our thoughts on it. We invite you to be part of that conversation. You can leave us a voicemail with your thoughts at 707-532-5269. That's 707-532-LBOX. Or you can comment on the show at Longbox Crusade, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Or you go old school and contact us with email, contact at longboxcrusade.com. Your comments might just get played on a future episode. Now it's time for the show. Let us dim the lights and travel back in our minds to a London of the past, through the chilled and foggy streets of London to 221B Baker Street. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. Say, and I've got a little something to tell you myself. I want to tell you that if you haven't sent in for your free recipe calendar... I think we've still got enough on hand to take care of you if you hurry. The requests have been pouring in like mad, literally by the thousands. No wonder. It's really a terrific offer. It's a calendar for 1945 and 46. It's in full color, and it tells you all you have to know about cooking with Petri wine. Write to Petri wine, P-E-T-R-I, Petri wine, San Francisco 26, California. San Francisco 26, California. But better hurry so we can get your recipe calendar to you immediately. And now let's drop in on our good friend, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Foreman. Where are the puppies tonight? Well, I, I found them playing with a dead seagull, so they've been sent up to bed in disgrace. <laughs> you certainly look comfortable yourself, Doctor. Uh, what's that small blue book you're reading, the latest bestseller? No, 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 indeed not. This book was never a bestseller, my boy. It's entitled Practical Handbook of Bee Culture. With some observations on the segregation of the queen. Quite a catchy title. Who's the author? A fellow by the name of uh, Sherlock Holmes. He was engaged in writing it when the adventure I'm going to tell you about took place. Well, you told us last week, Doctor, that a pair of canaries played an important part in the story. That's quite right, Mr. Foreman. It was in the summer of 1908, I remember, and I had persuaded Holmes to leave his Sussex bee farm for a few weeks and to join me in a holiday at the little fishing village of Kingsgate in Kent. We were staying at a charming little inn called the Fisherman's Arms, and for the first few days, our holiday was a delightful one. And then... And then, I suppose, Doctor, strange things began to happen. They did indeed, Mr. Foreman, they did indeed. Very strange thing. One afternoon, we'd just finished a late tea, I remember, and were sitting outside on the lawn sunning ourselves and enjoying our pipe. Holmes lay back with his long, thin fingers clasped behind his head, gazing thoughtfully at the multicolored fishing boat, bobbing at anchor in the harbor. After a moment or two, he spoke to me. What's in your your splendid companion? I can't think of anyone else who would let me smoke my pipe in silence for half an hour without asking me what I'm thinking about. That's not very surprising, Holmes, after all the years that we've been together. Well, nevertheless, the gift is a rare one, old chap, and I appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Overlo. Uh, by the way, since the half hour's up, what have you been thinking about? <laughs> the lack of enterprise of a modern criminal. Audacity and romance seem to have passed forever from the criminal world. Read this note I received this morning, old fellow. See for yourself how low I have sunk. Oh, it's a look. Mr. Holmes, I am staying in the same inn as yourself, and as I have had a very frightening experience, 
Excuse me. I thought perhaps you would help me. Please do. It's signed Mary Victor. An exciting document, isn't it? Written on lavender note paper, reeking of perfume, and the handwriting is obviously that of an adolescent girl. You haven't bothered to answer the course. Oh, yes, I have. I sent a message back by our good landlord that I would be glad to see her. Why, Holmes? You came down here to complete your handbook on bee farming. Oh. Confound it. Those two wretched canaries are getting their sun bath on the windowsill above us. Oh, I think it's rather jolly to tell those fellows chirping away up there. Oh, I find the sound most distracting. Let's go inside. You know, Holmes, those birds are owned by a charming couple, a Mr. and Mrs. Wainwright. I was chatting with them on the stairs this morning. I'm afraid their charm will escape me as long as their pets continue to tweak in that irritating manner. We've spoken of the peace and quiet of the country inn, Watson, and yet I find that... Come in. Ah, Miss Mary Victor, I presume. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Please come in and close the door, won't you? Thank you. This is my old friend, Dr. Watson. You may speak quite freely in front of him. How do you do, Victor? How do you do, Doctor? Now, sit down, young lady, and tell me what's troubling you. Mr. Holmes, I came down here from London to get away from someone, but I'd been followed. I've been afraid to leave the inn, until last night I felt I couldn't stand being cooked up any longer. So I went for a walk on the seashore. Someone followed me, Mr. Holmes. I ran back here as fast as I could, but now he knows where I live, and I'm frightened. Please help me. My dear Miss Victor, I'm afraid you must be much more specific before I can help you. Who has followed you down here, and why are you afraid of him? I'll tell you the whole story. It'll sound strange to you, but I swear it. Oh, there it is again, down by the gate. I'm going to my room. Now, 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 now. No. Don't you be frightened, Miss Victor. I'm sure we'll be... Oh, that's all. What do you think? I don't see anyone outside who might frighten her. There are two or three fishermen loitering about. Wait a minute. Here's a young fellow walking up the path. Come on, Watson. I'm through the French window again. Oh, gracious me. Here we go again. I think we'll take the liberty of accosting him. Excuse me, sir. Yes? Are you looking for Miss Mary Victor? Is she young and pretty? Yes, sir. She is. Excuse me, sir. Then I'm looking for her. Where can I find her? I can see you're being facetious, sir. Well, there's no harm in that, is there? By the way, who are you, gentlemen, may I ask? My name is Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. I'm Basil Carter. You're not Sherlock Holmes, are you? That is my name. I thought you seemed familiar. I know your brother, Mycroft. Oh, indeed. Then I presume you're connected with the Foreign Office. Yes, I'm in the Consular Service. Are you staying at the inn, young man? For a few days. It's funny that I should run into the great Sherlock Holmes. I may I ask? I was planning a murder. Oh, really? But, but gentlemen here, I see that I shall have to be very discreet. Uh, who is your intended victim, may I inquire? There are two of them. The two canaries in the room next to mine. Oh, canaries. <laughs> the moment I thought that you, you were really serious. But I am serious. serious. The wretched creature will be driving me mad. Yes, I quite sympathize with you, sir. I've been thinking of committing a slight case of mayhem under my soap. We can take one apiece, Mr. Holmes. Well, I'm glad to have met you both. I'll probably see you again. Uh, goodbye. Uh, goodbye, sir. Goodbye. I don't like that fellow, Holmes. If you ask me, he's the man who's been fighting the poor girl that came to us. He had a peculiar look on his face. When you asked me, he was looking for Mary Victor. Well, there's only one person who can settle the question, and that's the young lady herself. Come on, old fellow. Let's go back and go. Uh, here comes Wainwright, the owner of the canaries. Uh, good evening, Mr. Wainwright. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, this is uh, my friend, uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I'm honored to meet you, sir. How do you do, Mr. Wainwright? Beautiful evening, isn't it? I just took a stroll down to the store to get some more birdseed. By the way, Mr. Holmes, I hope our canaries don't bother you. Little fellows are such comfort to my wife and me. Oh, no, not at all, sir. I find that chirruping very soothing. Oh, I, I'm so glad. <laughs> good night, gentlemen. Oh, good night, sir. Good night, Mr. Wilson. Not Wilson, Mr. Holmes. Wainwright. Oh, I beg your pardon. I'm so sorry. I thought you said Wilson. Good night. <sighs> Not like you to mix up names, Holmes. I didn't mix them up, old fellow. I never forget a face. Mr. Wainwright is in reality Wilson, the notorious canary trainer, who I had the pleasure of sending to prison for a seven-year stretch in 95. Some years later, he made one of the most spectacular escapes from prison in the history of crime, and has since managed to evade all efforts to recapture him. Great Scott, he seems to sweet old fellow. Well, possibly he's reformed, but I doubt it. Our stage is set for an intriguing problem, old chap, and our cast is an interesting one. A frightened young girl, a diplomat of uncertain integrity, and a noted criminal. Watson, I have a feeling that once again the game's afoot. Holmes, why are we strolling along the pier instead of staying at the inn? I thought you said that you were expecting trouble. I am, old chap. 
And I'm sure it will find us out. You know, Holmes, I'm still completely mystified by the behavior of that girl, Mary Victor. I knocked at her door last evening again this morning. I couldn't get any answer. And the landlord told me that she was not seen at dinner last night, nor at breakfast this morning. And yet her room had not been vacated. Curious. Hello, there's the village constable sunning himself at the end of the pier. Yeah. Good morning, Sergeant Blake. Mr. Al, Dr. Watson. How are you, gentlemen? Yes, thank you, sir. I'm very appreciative of the weather that you've provided for us. I think nothing of it, sir. We always arrange that for our really distinguished visitors. Oh. <laughs> By the way, Mr. Elm, I was reading one of your friend's stories about you last night. The one called The Adventure of Mysteria Lodge. That was, uh, Wisteria Lodge, you, you foolish fellow. Well, maybe it was. <laughs> anyway, I was reading it aloud to me, old woman. And if you don't mind my saying, sir, Mr. Elms... We both thought you made a bad mistake. Oh, really? So, of course, you come out all right in the end. Oh, dear me, Sergeant. I stand reproved. Uh, excuse me, Sergeant. Holmes, Holmes, look. Look at that figure standing by itself right at the end of the pier. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Our friend Wilson, the canary trainer. He's got a revolver. Here, here. We don't want any of these going on in Kingsgate. Come on. Here, you. What are you doing waving that revolver about? Keep back, the three of you. I'm in law here. Don't tell me what to do. Keep back, I say. I'm not afraid of fire. Don't do as he says, Sergeant. You don't want to trifle with. Just exactly what are you up to, Wilson? You caught up with me once again, Sherlock Holmes. But this time you're not going to send me back to a prison again. And maybe the gallows. If I can't escape you, then I'll take my own way out with this revolver. Wilson, what in thunder are you talking about? The murder at the inn last night. I did it! Murder? I'm confessing in front of the three of you. Oh, you leave my wife alone. She didn't know anything about it. No... I hope you're satisfied, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. He's pointing the revolver as he has. Wilson, you fool, stop it. Strike me pink. He done it. Over the pier and into the sea. Get help, Sergeant. It's possible he isn't dead. Right, sir. Come on, Watson. We're going back to the inn, I suppose. Of course we are. We've just heard a murder confession, but we don't know who has been murdered. Holmes, um, what was the telegram that you, you sent off just now? A message to my brother, Mycroft. The innkeeper informed me that Basil Carter, the young diplomat we met yesterday, he and rather hurriedly in the early hours of this morning. Come on, let's go upstairs. Well, we'll have to break the news to Mrs. Wainwright, I suppose. Before we do that, I think we'll see if Miss Victor's in her room. Which one is it? Here, top of the stairs. Hmm. We'll take the liberty of looking in. Miss Victor has been seen since last night. Uh-huh. Unlocked. Lord, what a mess. Those strewn all over the place. Open suitcases. Yes, it Look looks at this. as if the young lady had been planning an immediate departure. Where can she be? I no haven't seen her since last night. Mary. I... Oh. oh, I beg your pardon, gentlemen. I thought I heard Mary Victor come in. I'm Mrs. Wainwright. Mrs. Wainwright, I'm uh, afraid we have some rather, uh, rather bad news for you. Your husband shot himself a quarter of an hour ago at the end of a pier, and his body fell into the sea. Is he dead? We must presume so, madam. I left the police sergeant there searching for him. Sergeant Blake should be back here in any moment now. So he did it, after all. You don't seem very surprised, madam. Uh, he threatened to do it. Mrs. Wainwright, before your husband shot himself, he confessed to committing a murder in this inn last night. A murder? Whose murder? At the moment, we're not quite sure. Oh, he must have been out of his mind. Mrs. Wainwright, I'm afraid I must ask you some rather painful questions. Are you aware that your husband was a criminal, that he served a prison sentence under the name of Wilson? Yes, I knew that. He told me when we were married two years ago. But he said that he'd gone straight ever since he'd come out of prison. That's why he changed his name. He was trying to make a fresh start. You know no reason for his planning to kill anyone at the inn? None. And unless you find someone murdered, I wouldn't give too much thought to it. Yes, if you'll forgive my saying so, madam, you seem remarkably unmoved by your husband's tragedy. Why should I pretend? We were very unhappy together. This might be the best way out of it for both of us. Oh, my, soul. my husband came quite a large amount of life insurance. In the event of suicide, would that be terrible? And on a policy, madam, then I must say that uh, from your attitude, I begin to doubt whether your husband is dead. What do you mean? I mean that if Mr. Wilson, or if you prefer it, Mr. Wainwright, wished to disappear in spectacular style, what could be simpler than to pretend to shoot himself, drop into the sea? Mr. Mr. I'm up here, Sergeant. Ah, did you find him? Yes, Mr. Elm. We fished him out right away. Dead as a doornail. 
showed himself to the early Dick. Well, that disposes of your last theory, Holmes. Did you find the revolver, Sergeant? This man got it right here with me. One bullet missing. Have you found out if anyone here has been murdered, Mr. Holmes? I found out very little as yet. Wait a moment. Listen. I don't hear anything. Exactly. You hear nothing. Yet we're within a few feet of the Wainwright's room. What do you mean, Mr. Holmes? I mean that uh, there is one sound we should be hearing very clearly at the moment. Why did I think of it before? The sound of your canaries chirruping. You've heard little else for days. Come on, Watson. Where are you going? Your room, madam. Hmm. I'm afraid I must uh, dispense with asking your permission. You're already in my room. It seems a little late even to mention the subject. Here's the bird case. The windows are Oh, where's the gun? No, old chap. If you look more closely, you'll see them on the bottom of the cage. Let me open this door and get one of them out. Oh, Joe Holmes. They're dead. And yet when we entered the inn a few minutes ago, they were still chirping. But who on earth would want to kill a couple of birds? That, my dear fellow, is one of the things we have to find out. So far, I must admit I'm puzzled. We have a self-confessed murderer, and the nearest thing we can find to a corpse is a pair of dead canaries. <laughs> We'll bring you the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second. A second I'll take, if you don't mind, to ask you if you've ever had a glass of Petri California Sherry. Because if you haven't, boy, you want to remedy that situation pronto. Try that Petri Sherry before dinner some evening. Look at its clear amber color. Smell the fragrance of those luscious grapes. And get a sample of that Petri flavor. Mmm, mmm. That Petri Sherry can turn the usual before dinner low into a main event. And say, if you like your sherry dry, as I do, wait till you taste Petri Pale Dry Sherry. Is that ever good? But after all, when it's a Petri wine, it's always a good wine. And now, back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. Strange events are taking place in the Kentish fishing village of Kingsgate. A self-confessed murderer has committed suicide, but his victim cannot be found. As we rejoin our story, the great detective and his old friend, Dr. Watson, are once again examining the room of Mary Victor, one of the missing guests. You know, Holmes, the murder that Wilson confessed to before he committed suicide might be in the, the killing of those two canaries. I think not, old chap. Wilson obviously loved the creatures and kept them in spite of the fact that they were dangerously apt to identify him with his criminal past. Uh-huh. Interesting. Very interesting. Huh? What have you found? This note, lying on Miss Victor's dressing table. Yeah. Have a look. You think you can hide from me, Mary, but you can't. Wherever I go, I shall follow you. So why not get wise to yourself and stop running away? <laughs> Sounds as if the poor girl was in danger, all right. Possibly, but the writer of that note was certainly obliging. Though the letter is unsigned, he at least gives us a clue to his identity. Oh, what clue? The phrase, get wise to yourself, is very un-English. It's American. Come on, old chap. Well, where are we going now? The envelope to this letter has the Kingsgate postmark on it. I should be surprised if that fount of all knowledge, the village postmistress, can't help us find an American visitor. <laughs> yes, I know the young man you must be looking for, gentlemen. His name's Walter C. Bunker. And he's been in here to send telegrams. And his accent's so strong you could cut it with a knife. It's just like one of the dead Indian fellows you read about, you uh, know. Can you tell me where he lives, uh, madam? Well, the heck, am, sir. Uh, he's been rooming at Mrs. Bell's house. Uh, 15 Laburnum Grove, uh, down behind the gas station. 15 it? Laburnum Grove, Mrs. Bell. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very much obliged to you. Hello, Mrs. Bell? Yes, sir. What can I do for you, gentlemen? Well, we understand that uh, Mr. Walter Bunker has been staying with you, madam. Yes, he has. A nice young American gentleman. Is he at home, may I ask? No, sir. Nothing worried about him. This morning, when he goes out, he asks me what nearest cemetery is. Cemetery? Oh, me. Huh? I tell him, and then he gives a queer kind of laugh. I'm not sure I'll see you anymore, he says. And then he walks off, and I haven't seen him since. I tell you, I'm worried about him, gentlemen. And where is the nearest cemetery, Mrs. Bell, the one you directed him to? About three miles from here. Mm -hmm. Just this side of Branson Woods. Thank you, madam. Come on, Watson. (laughs) 
cemetery seems deserted. The theory comes from the church. Oh, Lord, it's a funeral. Or a wedding. Come on. By Jove, it is a wedding home. I'm afraid we're on the false trail, but we'd better make sure. Following a false trail, confound it. The frightened young lady was merely frightened by her persistent American fiancé. Threatening letter that he sent her. Ambiguously worded, when you come to think of it. Anyway, we can cease to worry about Miss Victor. She is now Mrs. Bunker. I think we can assume that she's out of all danger. Oh, we've got to start all over again. Oh, no, no, my dear fellow. The field is narrowing. We'll head back to the inn now, and I have a feeling that we're on the last lap of our strange adventure. <laughs> Another suspect eliminated. This telegram is from my brother, Mycroft. I telegraphed him earlier on today to check on the movements of uh, Basil Carter, the young man who left the inn so mysteriously in the early hours of this morning. His answer informs me that the gentleman in question was recalled to the foreign office suddenly and arrived quite safely a few hours ago. Oh, well, now I'm completely puzzled. And I, old fellow, at last see daylight. Wish I did, Mr. Adams. Start and go upstairs and get dead man's widow and bring her to my room, please. Uh, and then I think I can give you the solution to this problem. What do you with me, Mr. Holmes? This is... Madam, you and Sergeant Blake make yourselves comfortable. Now, in the first place, the murder occurred this morning and not last night. I know what you're hinting at. The canaries. I admit I killed them. But you can't do anything to me for that. Why did you kill those birds? I hated them. As much as my husband loved them. And when I knew he was dead, their singing drove me mad. And so I killed them. Ah. But they must have been already dead when we told you of your husband's suicide. Oh, Watson, but the lady was uh, fully aware that her husband was dead when we informed her of the fact. You see, uh, she murdered him. You're talking rubbish. Yes, Mr. Holm. How could she have murdered him? We saw him shoot himself before our eyes. Because when Wilson raised that revolver to his head, he was convinced that it contained blank cartridges. Unfortunately for him, his wife had deliberately replaced the... Blanks with live cartridges. Good great heavens. Why? How? Let me reconstruct the case for you. Wilson, with the connivance of his wife here, had contrived a disappearance plot. He knew that I had spotted his real identity, and so he planned this rather dramatic exit. Confessed to a non-existent murder, and then, well, had his plan materialized, he was to shoot himself with a bank. Fall from the pier, an apparent suicide. What a fantastic scheme. How did he plan to get away? Well, he would have swum under the water, safe distance, and so made his escape. Oh, his plan couldn't have worked possibly. No, probably not, probably huh? not. But at least it was ingenious. He would have destroyed his true identity. And had his revenge on me by making the search for a murder that had never been committed. Unfortunately for him, his wife was his accomplice and saw in the scheme an excellent way of killing her husband. You think you're so very clever, Mr. Holmes. But if it were true... How could you prove it? Observe this revolver, Mrs. Wilson. It's the one your husband shot himself with. What can you prove from that? Ever hear of fingerprint tests? I've heard of them. But that revolver's been underwater. True, quite true. But uh, thanks to the research of my excellent friend, Dr. John Thorndike, an infallible test has been discovered for recording fingerprints even after immersion in seawater. I applied the test to the prints on the revolver and the bullets and compared them with some that we found on the water glass in your room. They are the same, Mrs. Wilson. Now, does a man let his wife load his suicide weapon? Sergeant Blake, I think it's obvious that the time has come for you to take over the case. All right. All right, so I did change the bullets. I hated him. I'm glad he's dead. And what's more, I do it again. Mr. Holmes. Yes, Sergeant Blake? Well, now that I've taken Mrs. Wilson to the station, booked her on a murder charge, I wonder if you'd mind answering a question. Which, sir? Uh, this, uh, fingerprint ah. test. I'd like to know about that. I've, I never heard of, of being able to take prints after a revolver has been handled two or three times and soaked in salt water. Yes, Holmes, and I'd like to know when you performed the test and took the prints off the glass in her room, I, I thought that I was with you all the time. <laughs> you were, my dear fellow. Well, then, I... I can give you the answer in one word. Bluff. 
What? There is no such test, my dear Watson. It would be almost impossible to expect clear prints <laughs> after so much handling and totally impossible after submersion. Fortunately for us, though, Mrs. Wilson was double enough to believe me and uh, give me a confession. And there's no such person as Dr. John Thorndyke? Oh, yes, yes, indeed there is. A great success last year in the case of the Red Tarmac. You didn't tell me about that case, huh? No, no, I didn't. It was deliberate, old chap. With your taste for uh, writing sensational stories, I was afraid you might publish the affair. Huh? Would it have mattered if I had? Oh, yes, it would. Huh? Uh, you would have given away, uh, what shall I say, professional secrets? You would have provided the public, and in particular, the criminal public, with a complete education on fingerprints. And when that happens, my dear Watson, we shall have no tricks left. That will be a sad day for detectives. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes Adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of Wisteria Lodge. Mr. Rathbone appears to the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer and Mr. Bruce, the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This is Bill Foreman saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Okay, folks, now it's time for our highs and lows of the episode. But first, let me introduce my special guests. I have joining me my older, wiser brothers, the Mycroft and my Sherlock. It is Jason, the Weasel Skull Albrick. Welcome back to 221B, Jason. Well, it's good to be back. I'm all loaded up on my Petri wine. I made sure I got that calendar be with the recipes because, whoo, they've been telling us for the last 15 episodes that they're about to run out. And by golly, mm -hmm. I'm starting to believe them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, like Sherlock Holmes, I don't like singing birds. All right. That Which is why birds. he has cats to go after all those birds. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. As you just heard, it is our old friend, Pat DJ Cristados. Welcome back to 221. B-E-D-J Cristados. It is great to be back here. And I just want to, you know, take a moment here and say, you know, we're the LBC crew family who took the time to make podcasts so fine. <laughs> and as Jason mentioned, we still have some room for recipes for the LBC recipe calendar we've been working on. Uh -huh. So, you know, if you can got some recipes for us, send it in to contact at longboxcrusade.com. And we will get it into our annual recipe calendar that we'll be making. I think the last recipe someone sent us was from about four years ago. Mm -hmm. I think it was Aaron Moss. And it was like some kind of a mushroom. I made it. I'm the one who made it, I think. I Since made poutine one time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Jason made it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We take the recipe seriously. We do. Yeah. <laughs> Here, people. Oh, yeah. You send a recipe to contact at longboxcrusade.com. And one of us is going to make it and eat it on an episode and tell you what we think. Again, yeah, we, we definitely take the time to make podcasts so fine. The, my favorite thing about that is I see, because we're doing this, so I can see you on camera, you glance off to the right as if you've written this down, you have it on a sticky note or something. <laughs> I, <do. laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, okay. So this is the shenanigans you've got to deal with. It's the three of us here at 221B. We're going to talk about this canary episode. So let's get into the highs and lows and what those. Let's start with Jason. Round one, fight. I guess I'll go with the high. I liked how they took it out to a whole nother location. You had kind of Holmes and Watson out of their element, trying to get away for a nice little, little vacation, get a break from the crime of London. And then, of course, they stumble onto another mystery within a few days of them being there. So I like the irony of them trying to get a vacation and ending up having to solve a murder mystery by the end of it. It's like they're magnets for this kind of thing. <laughs> Just trouble magnets. Yeah, that was nice to get them out in the countryside. And you bring up a great point, Jason. It's radio. <laughs> but yet, yeah. we felt like we were out in the countryside. You definitely felt like these were two boys just trying to have a holiday. That it seemed like they were more relaxed. Holmes was a little more relaxed at the beginning, and then, but by the end of it, it's back to business. So, 
Yeah, I like that that he was he was so relaxed. He's like Watson, you're the best friend a guy could have. Because I've been sitting here smoking this pipe for like I don't remember how long. He's like, you haven't even asked me what I'm thinking. <laughs> That's 30 minutes, minutes. 30, 30 minutes. 30 minutes. 30 minutes. That's two yeah. men hanging out. I don't I don't even ask you what you're thinking about. <laughs> then Watson X X um, okay, it's been 30 minutes. Let me ask you now. Because we all know the answer, right? Watson would be like, Holmes, what are you thinking about? Holmes would be like crime. <laughs> Holmes would be like, Watson, what are you thinking about? Watson would be like sandwich. <laughs> Pubs. Pubs. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Pat, what do you think? Round one. High, low, what the? I'm going to give it a high on this one because this one had you guessing of what's actually going on. It's like there was three things that actually were happening in this as you count through it. And it's had me wondering, okay, well, is someone dead? What's going on? What is the crime that happened here? And how is this all going to get solved? But he goes through and he solves everything that was left open. And I like that because I'm like, oh. Well, maybe it isn't that person then. I guess not, because now we, now we figured out who it is and, and what they're really doing here. So I'll give a hats off to this one had me guessing on what was really happening here. And then not in a bad way. I was, I'm like, we're going to get to the bottom of this. Yeah, red herrings as far as the eye could see on this one. And it was kind of neat because a lot of times, like last episode, I think we did Viennese Strangler, right? Mm -hmm. And you had red herrings because you had to kind of figure out who done it, right? And this one was almost like you had to figure out which one was the actual mystery. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like there was three things going on and you're like, okay, well, which one's the mystery? So that, yeah, I couldn't decide. I almost would put that as a what the, cause at first I was like, do I like this? Cause part of me felt like, did they make this episode and realize it wasn't going to fill up the 25 minutes? <laughs> so they just like <laughs> added extra things. But like, even if they did, I felt like you, Pat, it kept me engaged because I kept mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, what, how is this going to, oh, it's not going to connect. Okay. So that's a whole other thing. <laughs> okay. So anyways, back to the top of the order, Jason, what do you got? Mine's a what the, maybe you fellas can answer this question for me. Cause I didn't quite understand the wrap up of the original lady that requested his help because there was somebody stalking her. And then they ended up going to a cemetery, but then there was a wedding and, and he was like, well, mystery solved. She's getting married. And I'm like, wait. I got married. She getting married to the stalker guy? I don't understand what he happened. He was never here. a stalker. He was actually her suitor. And she was having cold feet. She basically got that pre-wedding jitters. Oh, okay. And was like, I don't know if I want to get married. But she didn't actually say that. She's just like, oh, I'm worried about this guy. Oh, there's that guy. Oh, that's that guy who's following me. And it basically had to figure out. Well, she out like wrote to him. She's just like, yeah, I need me. your help with this. Like it was if you know Watson, he would have put a cap in him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? It was basically just her having pre-wedding jitters, wanting to know how she could maybe get away from this, get away from the responsibility. But then apparently the two got together and they got calmed down and she they happily married. To me, it kind of seemed like the, you know, because he was the American and he was writing her letters and maybe she was taking the letters wrong. And then they finally got together and I guess eloped maybe. They got you know, married right somehow, there. Yeah, they got married in the in the, the church in the cemetery real quick or something like that. And inter it was interesting. Yeah. But I'm going to say that that's, that's a dislike for me. Because <laughs> I was... You know, I, I probably listened... Oh, I know I listened to it twice in the last week. So I was able to kind of put that together. This would be the third time overall. Because I listened to it once months ago and then two times to prep for the show. So, But I, I'm with you, Jason. Because I had to like really pay attention. I was like, okay, so... So I, what I did is I really paid attention to what she said in her letter and what she said in front of Holmes and Watson, which in both instances is actually very little. And that's why it's confusing because you think, well, she wrote this letter and she had this encounter. But if you go back and listen to it, there's very little information given. And it ends up just being she's cold feet on getting married. Because I thought when they went to her room, I was like, uh oh, it's going to be like the last episode. She's going to be dead in the room. But then they get diverted into a whole nothing mystery and so i was scratching my head i like too many mysteries man <laughs> it was like the, the mystery was what is the real mystery right, right. It was yeah. like you can't count this as a dupe man when you have like three mysteries <laughs> it's not fair i have no chance I, I, that's i was really split down the middle about that because part of me felt that way like this 
too much going on and they really just padded it for time. But another part of me felt the way Pat did, where it was like, it, it, it kept me engaged because I'm yeah. trying to figure out. And, and that kind of, and that goes into my, I, know, I guess I'll, it's another high on this one that I, I, I liked it, was that it did keep me engaged. And to find out what the actual mystery was, to have the guy, you know, shoot himself, but it was all, you know, and the wife's the one that changed the bullets around. It's like, oh, wow, that was kind of interesting. I, I knew there was, he was kind of in cahoots or something was going on, but for her, I'm like, that's cold blooded to do, <laughs> do what she did. That's harsh. That is, you know, I mean, obviously she didn't like him or something was going on. She wanted the money. It it sounded like she was looking to get some money and she just didn't like him anyway. And she hated the birds. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) Cared too much about the birds, needed the money, whatever. But I'm like, whoa, you know, this went from, you know, two different diversions to really finding out, okay, well, did this guy do something? What's going on? And then to find out the killer is layers down even deeper <laughs> and i like that it, it really kept me guessing what was happening and i know i've had my two turns but to kind of tack on to what pat was saying like i figured it out pretty easy the actual murder i got that i put the clues together the birds were dead she killed the husband like before he even had a chance to kill himself she killed those birds i had that but what i did like was how Holmes tricked her into confessing. I thought that was really yeah, smart. Yeah, that was another good point. Because that's where I got fooled. I was like, oh, I didn't know they could take breath. <laughs> that was really good scientific technology back in 1908 or whatever it was. He's like, no, fool, we can't do that. <laughs> you know, she, lying. she was pretty clever. I mean, because essentially it was murder by suicide, right? The yeah, guy was yeah. like, going to fake his suicide. For those of you who didn't pay attention when you were listening to this episode, it's going to fake, fake his suicide. She put real bullets in, so mm-hmm. it would be, become a real suicide. Really, the only thing she screwed up is she should have waited until she was told to kill those birds. Yep. That's what the birds put too them, early. Yeah, they put, uh, put on the scent, and then she fell for the ruse of, oh, we can take fingerprints off of a gun that's been underwater. Yeah. If, if she had known better and just clammed up, she might have got away with it. <laughs> Yeah, prove it. Yeah. So, like, that whole, like, murder by suicide layer thing, I thought that was really good. And then, like I said, it's kind of split down the middle on the peripheral things that ended up not really meaning anything. Because there was even that, there was even, like, another guy, right? Yeah. The guy from uh, Minecraft's. From, uh, yeah. From guy from Minecraft. Or whatever. Yeah. yeah. That was Just there, too. Hair, it's like, everywhere. Yeah. But, you know, I think they did a really good job. Sometimes they do a really weak job at it. You know, where it's just, okay, it's not you, or they try to send you down a different path. But I think they did a decent job of just keeping a mystery about the three or four things that, you know, were going on. I would say this is probably the most layered episode we've maybe ever had. The other one that comes close to mind was the maybe our very first episode, the Double Zero, where they were mm. in the casino. The casino, yeah, yeah. And that had kind of a lot of layers to it. I think this one had even more. but. I'll do a quick around just to ask you guys, what did you think on this episode of the voice work? I think they always tend to do a, a pretty good job. Do you guys have any thoughts on voice work? Jason, do you have any thoughts? No, I thought the voice work was excellent. You know, the radio quality was a little, you know, it's just old, but they spoke very clearly so I, I could understand what was going on. I liked how they do just enough narration to set the scene. Sometimes so you know what action is happening. They seem to find that right balance of using uh, sound effects, the narration, and just kind of the dialogue so that you get a good picture in your mind of the environment that they're standing in, what actions people are taking. It's very gripping. I, you know, my mind doesn't wander. It really, you know, follows the thread of the story. So props to them for that. Anything to add, Pat, as far as voice work and all that kind of thing? I do agree with Jason on that. Uh, the vo- the actors they use and their voice works, just great. I think they do a really good job of putting you into that situation of or that area, you know. So you had a little, they were trying little different voice accents. And I like that. And especially when with multiple characters like that, 
you could distinguish between the characters. And I couldn't tell you, did, you know, the one that played the ladies, it could have been one or two, maybe a couple ladies, but just doing some different voices. And I wouldn't even known that. Yeah. We probably should start a new thing on the show called Who's Got the Most Interesting Voice in the Episode. And I think we'd all vote for the police constable. On yes. <laughs> but it made, but it made a real Hello, good Mr. Life. Holmes. <laughs> You made a grave mistake in that one, but you came out all right in the end. <laughs> Do you steer your lodge? I was reading it to my wife. <laughs> and he called the Mysterio Lodge, right? And then Watson yeah. was like, oh, that's, that's right, that's right. Fool. Yeah. I think he called him a fool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you fool. <laughs> I, I think that needs to become a new part of the show. Who had the Only Watson could voice. get away with that, too, like calling somebody. <laughs> I did like, though, you know what? Now that we're on that, I thought it was neat that the cop you know, said that he'd read the adventures and he said that Holmes had made a mistake or a misstep, but he came out all right in the end, right? And mm -hmm. he never said what it was. But I just really liked, I thought it was a good sort of character moment for Rathbone's Holmes, where he didn't take the bait, you know? He just like, no, okay, <laughs> cool, <laughs> you know? I thought, because, you know, he just, Holmes was kind of above it. He's like, you know, that's yeah. whatever, that's fine. Yeah, because when I read your adventures, I knew, oh, wait. <laughs> oh, wait. One of us <laughs> has adventures. <laughs> okay, well, we had a lot of chat about this one. This is a good one. You know, this might be one of the first ones where we focus completely on the story and not about what was going on with Petri Wine or yeah. Watson's dogs playing with dead seagulls, which is just weird. Uh, <laughs> then it was kind of weird, but they were in a timeout. They were in a timeout for that. But still, it's time to score it. So let's get our pipes out. Everybody keep an eye on Pat. On a scale of one to five pipes, one mean you hated it and it pushed you right off of Reichenbach Falls. Two is okay. Three, pretty good. Four, I, I like this one. And five, you loved it. It solved your mystery. Pat, what do you think? One to five. You know what? I'm going to give this a five. It was fun. I'm, this would be a re-listen -re for me as well, too, just for the fun that I had in it. And and going back, like you said, Jared, you know, you've done it a few times. So now I can go back and kind of trace back the other three, you know, or four stories that are going on and kind of piece those together. I understand. I understand. Jason, what do you think? Can't go quite as high as a five, but it's a solid four for me. It was really enjoyable. Even the moments that I was scratching my head and we talked about earlier, I was able to still able to follow kind of a variety of convoluted plots through the whole thing and ended up at the end, understanding the story and being entertained the whole way. So, yeah, four for me sounds right. And I'll split the difference at a 4.5. And that is it for this episode. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Something's afoot here. Uh, Can't have 4.5 canaries. How many canaries uh, do you have? Oh, man, I have really Joe November at a 4.5 here, but he's not on the show. Whoo. Hmm. I, you know what? I will. I'll give it a four. I'll give it that strong four. Just I'm kind of pulling a Delvin here to see if there's not going to be something that comes later. But I really did like this one. Maybe it was like I said. I was split down the middle about whether I like the rabbit chasing stories that were going on. And I don't know. Maybe I'm a guy who likes it a little cleaner cut. So all right, I'm going to go with a four. How would you rate it out there, folks? Let us know. You can hit us up in lots of different places. And I'll tell you the best way, Long Box Crusade, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. It's all Long Box Crusade. And we definitely would like to see how you would score it. How are you enjoying these radio shows? We want to hear from you. Because that's it for this episode of LBC Regulars, the Sherlock Holmes podcast. I want to thank my guests. Let's see where they can be found on the internet. Let's start with Jason. Well, I'm still kind of staying off the social medias these days, but you can find me at R-A-A, P as in Papa, H-O, at yahoo.com. And let's uh, start a dialogue. There you go, Pat. Where can they find you? Well, Jared, I'm glad you asked. When I'm not making fine podcasts, <laughs> you can find me on the Twitter at Christatos01. Where can you be found, Jared? Oh, I can be found in lots of different places, but mostly at Yard Sale Artist, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. It's all at Yard Sale Artist. Check out my wares at www.theyardsaleartist.com. And remember, you can leave us a voicemail with your thoughts at 707-532-5269. 707-532-LBOX. All right, pick up the phone. <laughs> pick up the phone, governor. 
Or, of course, you can drop comments at Longbox Crusade, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. You can email us at contact at longboxcrusade.com. We love your comments. We just might play them or read them on a future episode. So if you're digging this whole radio thing, you like going back in time with us, let us know. Thanks for joining us. As a reminder, we couldn't do this show and all of our other shows on the Longbox Crusade Network without the support of our Crusaders Club members on Patreon. And you can join their ranks for as little as $1 a month at www.patreon.com slash longboxcrusade. And we'll now thank our Crusaders Club members as we ride off in our handsome cab. I've been your host, Jared Albrecht, the Yard Sale Artist, and I look forward to joining you on the next episode. And Helica Wolf. Ooh. Alburn Elvis. Blasted or stashing. Raxton Underwood. Captain Entropy. Clinton Robinson. Dave Collins. Battle Wagon. Battle Wagon. Ezra Gallo. Gary Viola. Ironmonger. Gene Hendricks. Gerald Green. Jason Keane. Jason Lady. Jeremy L. Jim German, Jim German, Jim German, Jim German. I hope you like Jim German too. Jim Meal. Joe Thomas. Dr. John Watson. Josh Strickland. Candace Ward. Captivating Kathy Bright, the MVP. Mark Ross. Maxwell Traver. Miranda W. P.D. Devins. Paul Hicks. Rick from Jeff and Rick Present. Rob Morgan. Ryan Daly. Samantha Maney. Sean Urbanski. Spidey 67. Spreadsheet. Steve Cronin. Tim Price. Tony Pennington. And Toronto Cops.